are the feet of those who bring good news. And y'all, there are some gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful feet in here this morning. Really beautiful. As I've been praying about this message to share with you this morning, over and again, the words I just keep hearing are, well done, good and faithful servants. Um, we have a long race to run. And in the midst of this race as we're running, I just over and over again as I prayed, felt the Lord say, well done. Well done. Well done, evangelists. Well done, spouses of evangelists. Especially well done, spouses of evangelists. We are strange creatures. Well done, families of evangelists. Well done, administrators dedicated to the work of evangelism. Well done, sound geniuses who help amplify our voice as we share the good news. Well done all who are part of this work. Gatherings of evangelists are true lifelines for me. True, true lifelines. I work with the entire body of Christ, and yet a good chunk of my time is spent in mainline churches who are just recently, at least in the, the current 50 plus years, are waking up to the need for evangelists. So when I began this work, 20 years ago and just came bubbling in and I would meet with our leaders and they would go, ah, you need to get ordained. And I'd go, no, no, don't feel a call to ordination. Youth worker? No, no, I, I will talk with youth, absolutely, but no. Um, uh, do you want to do formation? No, no. Um, I, I'm an evangelist. Evangelist. Evangelist, what are we going to do with you? Oh, you know what? We're going to put you out in the parking lot, and you can do parking lot ministry. Because, because you're really excited about Jesus, probably too excited to be a greeter. So we're going to put you to welcome people as they get out of their cars. And, and you can bring your team of evangelists. I said, I have a whole team. We're ready to go. You, you can have your whole team out there. Now, what's great, um, uh, for better or for worse, the urgency, and the urgency has come through mainly a lot of our churches are dying on the vine. Uh, because we haven't been about the business of sharing the good news of Jesus, are saying, we need evangelists. So all of a sudden, my phone is ringing off the hook. For, for a while, I was one of the only diocesan evangelists in the country. We're, I'm still in an evangelical diocese, um, one, of the, one of the few left. And they would, but now they're calling and saying, we need evangelists. Can you come teach us? Can you come share us? And so it, there is an inter, we're at an interesting time in the body of Christ, what's happening um, in mainline churches are now reaching out to evangelical brothers and sisters and saying, come. And so, so in the process of doing the trainings, the church is being evangelized. And what is amazing is seeing the church wake up and say, oh, I've been longing to hear this. This is the best news I've ever heard. I was just up in Western Massachusetts. By the way, we're doing a revival there this weekend. I have to leave at lunch today because we're doing a revival. We are in our third overflow space in Western Massachusetts um, with Episcopalians coming together to hear about Jesus. But when we did the trainings, they said, we haven't heard Jesus spoken here and preached here in so long. And people with tears in their eyes. So God is on the move throughout the body of Christ. Um, lest, we, lest we get discouraged. Lest we get discouraged. Um, so, I told the Lord a long time ago that I would go places no one else wanted to go. And he has totally taken me up on that. <laughs> um, but we know as evangelists that sharing the good news is the best workaround. There is never a dull day. 
Um, I can't wait to get up in the morning just to see what God is going to do that day. And it's not always easy, but we know as we reach beyond ourselves, which as evangelists is the work we're constantly doing, that's where the joy is found. The joy of the prayer this morning was, was we, we're choosing joy. We're saying yes to joy. As John said in his first letter, we can just hear the joy palpably coming out of those first followers of Jesus. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen and heard, which we have touched with our hands, which we have seen with our eyes, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared to us and we have seen it and we testify to you and we share this with you so that our joy may be made complete. Our joy is made complete as we pass on this good news that we have, we have received. And we know as evangelists, this is where joy is found. And we get to see it. We get to see new life. We get to see babies being born in Christ all the time, transforming each person and renewing the face of the earth. What a privilege we have. What a privilege. So I hope today will be a day of gratitude. A day of gratitude. Blessed are the feet of those who bring good news and how much our world needs good news. And how many days do most of us feel we wake up in the morning and have such deep and profound compassion just like Jesus when Jesus says he looked out on the crowd and he had compassion on them and he saw people who were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Indeed, we are living in a world that is filled with harassed and helpless people. The harvest is absolutely plentiful. And in some ways, this is encouraging. The sheep are not apathetic. The sheep are not atheistic. The sheep are simply searching for a shepherd. Yes, um, it's true we're becoming more secular, but we're not becoming less spiritual. Over um, still close to 100% of Americans would claim that they are spiritual. Over 80% say they still pray or reach out on a daily basis. After the royal wedding, um, the uh, presiding bishop preached a message, not the full gospel, but just gave people a little hint of the love of God. And do you know, um, they said that it, it absolutely exploded our, uh, our media, social media things, because it, it overloaded our system, because um, Anglican was one of the most Googled words that day, right after the royal wedding. Why? Why is that? Um, that's never happened. <laughs> but it's because it's because they got just a taste of the love of God, and we're saying, I want more of that. For 50 days here in Dallas, over 300 churches got together all across the body of Christ, all denominations, and went out onto the streets. From, we began a prayer in the morning from 7 a.m. until 10 o'clock at night in schools, on the streets, in businesses and went out and shared Jesus, shared the gospel message, um, literally took people through the Roman road and prayed for people all over the city. We saw 6,000 people come to know Jesus during that time. But we all, we would come together at night and testimony after testimony is people who were absolutely hungry and desperate for some good news. It's like Paul. When Paul walked into Athens, he was heartbroken. And I think part of the burden of an evangelist is carrying that heart of Jesus that we look out and we see a helpless and harassed world. And the word, uh, the Greek word used there was Paul wasn't just like kind of troubled by it. It says he was bent over in pain. It hurt him so deeply. But what we see Paul do, he didn't stay in that sense of discouragement. He rose up went into Athens, he also did not criticize their search. 
He says, I see that you are searching in every way, and I affirm that search. But what I'm here to tell you is what you are searching for has been made known in and through Jesus Christ. And that is our work. <clears throat> our hearts are broken, and then we're moved, and we're emboldened by the Holy Spirit to love people, to meet them where they are. I see, I see that you're searching. But I'm here to bring you good news. What you're searching for has been made new. I'm going to read from a passage from Paul and, and highlight five things this morning, five C's. If you haven't had your coffee, I'm making it easy because the words all start with C. But we're, I'm going to read a passage that is very familiar to evangelists. But let, let us let Paul minister to us this morning. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we see no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has gone, the new is here. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, in the time of my favor I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. And this passage speaks volumes to us as evangelists. And I want to highlight five encouragements from Paul this morning that will hopefully foster some conversation about the work God has called us to do. The first encouragement from Paul is for us to be See, convinced. Paul says we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all die. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. I can remember <clears throat> when I went to seminary to study at Oxford, my friends were so worried. They said, oh no, don't, don't go there. Don't go to... Don't go to seminary, you know what they call it, cemetery, and you're going to Oxford, like one of the most secular universities. This is going to kill your faith. This is just going to kill it. And I said, fine. If I get there and find out it's not true, I'd rather know sooner than later, why would I want to dedicate my life to a lie? And so I got there and I spent three years um, with some of the top scholars looking at the evidence for the resurrection, looking at the life of the historical Jesus, examining the veracity of the Bible, and I left more convinced than ever that Jesus was and is the Lord of life and God himself, and he is alive and at work in the world. Faith in the New Testament, that word for faith is not a step in the dark or wishful thinking or one of many ways. It's actually a step into ultimate reality. Are we convinced, evangelists? That's our first question. Are we convinced? And if we are, how do we stay convinced? We need to train like athletes. Some of us might have questions still. I encourage you, press into those questions because the answers are there. Press into them. Find a mentor. Work them out. Train like an athlete. 
The more I questioned the resurrection, the more evidence I found, and the more and more I was convinced. We need to be people who are absolutely convinced. And then we need to help people who have questions, who aren't convinced. Part of our work as evangelists is to equip the church to witness, to do the work in, of an evangelist. And our world has questions, hard questions. Does God love gay people? That is the question our society is asking. Why do hurricanes happen? Is God sexist? As evangelists, we need to press into these questions. We need to know how we're going to answer them. And we need to equip the body of Christ in how to answer them. Does this mean we're apologists? Apologists do great work. I think what it does mean is we read the apologists. We study. We go deep. We spend time with people like Rabbi Zacharias in, in his teachings. And then we translate it into coffee talk so we can help people. We're like the, the we are the, the, we are roof removers for people in our church. We are helping people, help people get their friends on mats who are sick to Jesus. So we need to help them. We need to help them understand, help, help them, give them some tools to add, answer these questions. I often have people say, wow, you really believe in what you're saying. And I say, yes, I do. And that is so faith building. Repent and believe. Well, we are asking people to believe. We are asking people, it's that Greek word, pasteu, to trust, to commit to, to put your weight down on. And as we are putting our weight down, like sitting in a chair, if they see us doing it, they, it's going to be part of God using us to woo them to Jesus. Are we convinced? Paul was convinced. The second thing is, we must be created anew. Paul says, from now on, we see no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. As followers of Jesus, we know that we have been created anew. And we are being created anew every day. His mercies are new every morning. For us as evangelists, doers who are out there doing, we are doers, aren't we? Are we allowing God to create us anew? Are we spending so much time doing the work of the Lord that we neglect the Lord of the work? J. John, uh, one of my mentors and evangelists, said, we can have so many irons in the fire that we put the fire out. <laughs> if our output exceeds our input, our upkeep will be our downfall. Are we ourselves being created anew? Jesus said, I will make you fountains of living water. He is the living water. But we become the living water as we drink from him and him alone. Think of a fountain. People are drawn to fountains. And we need to be those fountains as evangelists. But oftentimes, we go around splashing. And above all, people come to us, and then they want living water, and we're out of water. We need to drink from the source. Jesus says, abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And he says, with me, all things are possible. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Evangelists are doers. And our hearts burn within us for the lost. But first, we must abide. How are we created anew? The first is prayer. Jesus had to draw away to hear the Father, to align his heart with God's so he could do his will. John Wesley said, I have so much to do that I have spent several more hours in prayer so I am able to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we must meditate on God's word. Joshua 
God says to Joshua, meditate on my word and you will be successful in all of your ways. And that word meditate, that Hebrew word is hagah, which means to chew vociferously, to meditate um, on God's word, like chewing the cut of a cow. We need to take time to praise and worship the Lord. I, I, I don't know about you all, every time I take just to praise, the devil goes away and flees. And we need to take a Sabbath rest. This is really hard for evangelists. God rested, Jesus rested, and we must rest. Um, John Stott, who worked with Billy Graham, uh, and they started the Lausanne movement together, took an, uh, an hour a day for prayer and quiet with the Lord, half a day a week, one day a month of total quiet with the Lord, and one week a year. Are we being created anew? Are we fountains of living water? Let's not be dry wells trying to tap into our own water source because it's not there. John Wesley said, set yourself on fire and people will come watch you burn. <laughs> so what happens when we are created anew? Not only are we, we refreshed, and we also spend time with our family and those around us, we see the world with the eyes of Jesus. As Paul says, we no longer see people as we used to. We see them with fresh eyes, and we see through this missional lens, and we enter into the great adventure of God. Now, I don't know about you all, but when I start hankering for a pizza, I have two thoughts. I'm hungry for a pizza. And my second thought is, maybe the pizza guy doesn't know Jesus. Or I, I got in a car wreck the other day. A woman bumped behind me, and I pulled over to the side slowly, and I said, oh, Jesus, you have a divine appointment. I just know it. And sure enough, the woman said, I was on my way to the, I just, I'm so sorry. She was frantic. She just gotten out of the hospital. And I said, this is a divine appointment. Don't worry about the car. Do you know Jesus? And we started talking about Jesus, and I got to minister to her. She emailed me and said, I have never had a car wreck like that in my life. But, but, but that's what happens when we're, we're, we're made anew, right? When we're created anew, we see the whole world differently. Convinced, created anew. The third is committed. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Evangelists are some of the most committed people I know. I'm just talking with Daniel back here. He's on his 70th country where he goes to share Jesus. I think of my friend Allison who goes into brothels. I think of my friend Jody who tirelessly goes throughout Zambia, throughout the school system sharing Jesus. I think about um, Michael who goes into unnamed countries in the Middle East and has um, evangelized large groups of the Taliban. And I, I hope that we all share each other's story and the work that we're doing and, and encourage one another. And for those of you who are just getting started, my word for you is this. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. There are days when I want to stay curled under my duvet. And I think of my friends who are out there literally risking their lives. And I think, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up. Paul knew this all too well. Hardships, beatings, imprisonments. Um, my mentor, Michael Green, a great evangelist now in his 90s in England, um, when I first started working with him, our first outing together, our first evangelistic gathering was in a hospital with about 60 people. Those were people he had led to Christ while he was um, um, recovering from heart surgery in the hospital extraordinary. Um, the nurse told me we couldn't keep him in his bed at night. And she said it was real embarrassing because his gown was wide open. And he would have the little gurney thing and we would keep telling him to cover his gown to get back in bed. And she said he would kind of pull himself together and she goes, but he was going room to room. She goes, I think he was preaching to people. 
That's how I want to be. That's how I want to be. Um, I remember I was on my way to uh, a, a plane to, to Paris, and I'd been going hard for weeks and weeks, and I, I couldn't wait to have 24 hours. Just I knew we'd get off the plane and get settled, and I might get a crepe, and I get to just shower, and it was going to be so wonderful. Got off the airplane, and uh, our fellow evangelists were there, and they said, Are you ready? Are you ready? And they were ready. And I said, Yes. And we got in the car, and in my soul, I wasn't ready, but I said, you're ready, Lord. And they took us to a place that was filled with women and hijabs, and we got to share about Jesus. And later, when we got in the car, we found out that these were mothers and wives and sisters of some of the most dangerous, um, extreme Muslims in that part of Paris. We were in the area of track. I would have missed that if I had said, can I just go take a quick nap? Committed. Sometimes you might look out at other evangelists who are on the main stage and think, why am I not there? You know? Are there moments when I say, why am I not Beth Moore? Why, why, why aren't I on the main stage? doesn't matter. You're on God's main stage. You're on God's main stage. And spouses, there are probably times when you think, gosh, my spouse is always up there and getting all the glory and I'm at home and slaving away here trying to just keep this house in order. God sees it. God rejoices. God rejoices. Convinced, created anew, committed, Co-worker, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. As God co-worker, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Co-workers, evangelists, may we never forget that this is God's world and God's mission. He allows us and invites us and commands us and calls us to participate. But he is the great evangelist. We are to never do this in our own strength. My prayer every morning is, in Christ I am unconditionally loved, totally forgiven, completely accepted, daughter of a king for, you, for eternity. I am your ambassador, Lord. Do with me what you would like this day. We are co-workers with God. And we are, I'm going to wrap up shortly. We are co-workers with God's church. Evangelists, we cannot forget the church. Though sometimes we want to. And let me tell you, my, my part of, little part of the body of Christ, and um, I've had to stand up and speak biblical truth, and it has not been an easy time. And there are days when I think, Lord, please send me to Hillsong. <laughs> or the village church or another part of the body. I will I'll do evangelism workshops and then at the break someone will say, that was great, but do we have to say the name Jesus? And I just am crestfallen. But we go where God has called us to go. And we're to be faithful. We are to be faithful. We can't forget the church. D.L. Moody said, Why do the work of ten men when I can equip ten men to do the work? And there's something of particular vocation, I think, of evangelists right now. We are agents of unity in the body of Christ. We really are. Because we are keeping everyone, there are lots of theological divisions happening. Lots of divisions. And lots of people say, no, we interpret the Bible the right way. No, we do. And there, there's a lot of division happening. And there's a lot of division in our world. But as evangelists, we say, let's keep first things first. That God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
God came to earth and walked among us and taught us and showed us how to live and took on all of our sins on the cross and died and rose again so that the whole world might have eternal life and be in relationship with the Lord of life. We keep first things first and we call the whole body of Christ together to say we might disagree on a whole lot of things. But if you say, Jesus is Lord, I'm working with you, and let's move forward, and let's agree where we can agree and move forward for the cause of Christ so the world might know we are Christians by our love. Amen. Amen. Co-workers. My mentor, Michael Green, as I said, who's still going in his 90s sharing Jesus, I said, what is it that keeps you going after all these years? He said, I have an audience of one. An audience of one. And here's my final question. What compels us? Are we compelled by the love of Jesus? Or are we compelled by social media and trying to get our brand out there? Are we compelled by the gospel? I've put cards on your table of that moment when the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years just reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Evangelists, let's allow us to be evangelized today and to spend time with Jesus. And to hear him say, you are precious and honored in my sight. You are the apple of my eye. I love you with an everlasting love. You're a jar of clay, a beautiful jar of clay, with many, many cracks, and I know it. And in your weakness, I am strong. And through your cracks, I will shine my light. And as I heal you, you will then become my wounded healer in the world. Evangelist, today what do you want to give Jesus? Allow him to minister to all of us so that we can be people who are compelled. So are we convinced? Are we created anew? Are we committed? Are we co-workers? Are we compelled by the love of Jesus? Brothers and sisters, today is the day of salvation. Yeah.